Oh hi there. My name is Mez Breeze, otherwise known as Networker Mez, and I'm here to chat to you about several ways to tackle the realm of digital art and associated areas of creative practice, such as electronic literature. Hey dog. Sup? I wanna be a digital artist. Tell me how, yeah. And make it quick, I have a hot date playing around with chatroulette.com. It isn't going to start itself, you know? Um, that's, well, um, good to meet you too, I'm sure. You sure seem keen to get right to the point. Unfortunately my style of digital arts and electronic literature practice doesn't lend itself to such immediate unpacking, with easy descriptions. If you want to join the ranks of elite digital artists or writers, I'm not sure if I'm the right person to be talking to. Um, yeah, you are. You've got an arse-kicking mother-humping ranking on all the search engines. You spell your networker name with a U, rather than an O. You get invited to all the latest shows and you exhibit everywhere. So just filming, right? Um, well, I'm not sure I'd agree with you with all of that. I have been practicing as an online electronic creative since back in the dark ages, that is, 1995. Back then I used online chat sites and code programs to create interactive microfictions which evolved gradually into my language system termed Mesangle. The theorist Catherine Hales once described Mesangle as a bilingual practice that breaks the conventional link between phoneme and written mark, forging new connections between code and English. Oh yeah, I know all about Mesangle. It's mad real, where you use all those backwards and forwards brackets and jumbled stuff, yo. Um, well, yes, you can choose to interpret it like that. I must say I think of it as evolving from immersion in email exchanges, computer programming languages and chat software such as Ytalk, web chats, and IRC. To mesangle means to take poetic phrases and alter them in such a way as to extend and enhance meaning beyond the predicted or the expected. It is similar to making plain text hypertextual via the arrangement and expansion of words via the insertion of symbolic and actual computer code. Mesangle attempts to rewrite traditional poetry conventions through layered meanings that are both structurally and symbolically embedded in each work. Mesangle has at its core a social commentary function. It is largely reactive to, and evolves within, online information streams. When creating with Mesangle, my aim is to encourage continued exploration via technology through curiosity, play and repeated questioning and collapsing of institutionalized concepts involving art and theory. Erm, yeah. That's what I said. I mean, without, the extra bits. But yeah, I wanna get all radical. I wanna make things that don't fit. I wanna make all the shiny. I wanna make new aesthetic like electronic literature. Tell me more about that. Hmm, I can see you're not really clear on what makes someone want to start using technology for artistic or expressive production. Let me give you a bit of background that might help when considering taking the path of a digital writer or artist. Yeah, yeah, get on with it. I'll try. The first concept you need to get your head around is to do with the notion of elastic identities, or avatars. For digitally connected or networked artists, Identity operates as a crucial projective platform, one that allows them to establish an identity or even a brand. Artists might use fluctuating identities for both directed expression, such as the appification of traditional artist physical spaces via augmented reality technology, or simply as a way of developing a persona via which to create or engage directly with an audience. For these types of creatives, identity becomes a series of fragmented reality sets that need to be constantly channeled, monitored and updated. I getcha. You're saying I can use my World of Warcraft character as a cheap way to make art, right? Um, no, not as a way of making art on the cheap, it's not as simple as that. Take for instance, one of my latest collaborations with a group of international artists called The Third Faction. I'm one of the founding members of this arts guild based directly in the game of World of Warcraft. We try to subvert out of the box gameplay by encouraging empathy and cooperation in a progression loaded game environment. One past project of ours, called Slash Hug, attempted to establish a non governmental aid organization in the World of Warcraft game environment. 
We did this through a mixed reality installation that demonstrated the work of the Third Faction Collective and was inspired in part by the actual Red Cross. The Slash Hug project was presented as an installation at an international arts exhibition held in 2009. It encouraged viewer interaction in carrying out helper missions through a hands-on approach by assisting other players while in-game and completing various quests. The Third Faction Collective have also just finished another project called DPS, or Demand Player Sovereignty, through a series of workshops that were presented at the 2011 Inter-Society of Electronic Arts at Istanbul in Turkey. LOL. Games for the win. Well, that's one way of looking at it I guess. I prefer to think of it as using appropriate avenues for expression and creation. I know that generally, many artists don't use games to produce artistic output, but there are many people that do. Search for Joseph Dilap's project, Dead in Iraq, or Jody's, Untitled Game. These examples really show how gamers who are both activists and artists can use gaming platforms to express conceptual and cultural inversions, using mediums traditionally slotted for pure entertainment. LOL. So, you do actually game for reals. Tell me your tune's name. What server are you on? Um, I'm not going to tell you what my main World of Warcraft tune or character is called. You can find that out yourself, I'm sure. Interesting though that even my main character created primarily for the act of gaming has now become a usable character that pops up in the variety of projects I've worked on over the years. She's appeared in a type of alternate reality documentary and has also been a secondary character in a mixed reality performance at a Canadian gallery. This installation and performance involved projection of the gaming character's Twitter stream and physical printouts of the dialogue that resulted between the characters and audience members using Twitter. She's also most recently popped up as part of a collaborative endeavor called Remix the Book, which I contributed to in character. Ha! Huh. I'll have to look that up later, right? And by the way, what's the skinny on that mixed reality stuff? How can reality be all mixed up? Now that's a very good question. Remember I was talking earlier about what makes artists want to begin creating in an electronic or digital realm? Well, utilizing mixed reality is one of the ways that creatives can make the leap from real-world creation, that is, making physical objects, to the virtual, that is, creating in a non-physical, or, as I term it, a synthetic environment. Mixed reality is the area that overlaps both definitive realities, what I call the nice middle ground that exists between the geophysical and the synthetic. Whoa, whoa. Slow down, egghead. I get the idea of the real being real and not so real, but how do newbies like myself get to use anything close to mixed reality? Do I get to dress up as a furry and go on cosplay? Hey, you're funny. But also strangely correct, in an odd way. Both cosplay and LARPing, or live action role playing, are mixed reality, in that they take elements from fictional and imagined or recreated narratives and worlds and perform them in the geophysical. To make the concept of mixed reality a little easier to understand, how about we take a look at some of the documentation from the projects I've just been talking about? It'll make things clearer, I'm sure. <laughs> DPS, or Demand Player Sovereignty, is a mixed reality civil disobedience movement started by the Third Faction. Our goal is to subvert the deliberate factional warfare within Azeroth while drawing parallels to synthetic manufactured conflicts taking place in the world at large. At the fourth annual Sub-Zero Festival, DPS hosted a field station that provided alternative quests within World of Warcraft and related interactions in the real world. A DPS member in-game gave each participant a quest to convince players on opposing sides to become friends. The real-life quests asked participants to meet a new friend at the festival, someone they may not have met otherwise. So either take a picture of you and them together as a friend or um, bring them back to the booth. Those hoping to receive an achievement badge completed these quests in order to gain reputation with Third Faction. 
Through these actions, DPS was successfully able to raise awareness about fabricated conflicts and the need for governmental transparency. Give peace a chance to crit. Join DPS for our next intervention, September 2011, in Istanbul, Turkey. Whose rules do you play by? I'm the one man army they saw. I've never been looking out. I keep MCs looking out. I drop signs like cross me drop the baby. Enough to make a nigga go crazy. Well, there sure was a lot of information packed into those videos. Any questions? Yeah. Do I ever? That synthetic word still makes me go. WTF. It's probably best to think of it as a simple replacement for the term, virtual. That way there's little room for confusion. I'm also working on a more in-depth theoretical look at the term as part of my augmentology project. I'm currently formulating the concept of synthetics. Synthetics are not just virtual representations of geophysically based real people. Instead, they are reality gradated presences that fluctuate in a presence coordinate system that spans the virtual and the phenomenologically real. Synthetics allow for identity formation that utilizes projective structures like avatars, game characters, and social networking profiling to create variable personality constructs like those I mentioned previously. These personality constructs may align closely with a geonormative or geotypical manifestation, similar to the top-level entity that inhabits the virtual or synthetic body of the character. They may or may not only glancingly resemble the actual real person who controls them. Oh geez, you lost me there. Can we just go back to giving me all the epic tips I need to get all famous and stuff for being a kick-ass digital artist? Like, can you tell me what the next big thing is gonna be, so I can jump on it before every hipster and their dog does? Hmm, well. I still don't think you're getting the point of all of this. The point is to get out there, and create, something. And if it's not the next best art form, or you're not using the next best software or application, don't worry, there is no such thing as the next big thing, only constant upgrading and reworking. There is, however, the idea of the next best fragment, the next best experimentation, the next best failure. The key is to be persistent and to create work that isn't necessarily dependent on the next best gadget, or platform. See what you can make out of what you have, not what you don't. It's all about navigation, about pattern recognition, about the ability to search for, and create, not only information, but also systems that underpin the data and how they themselves have, or can be, constructed around flows, intentions, and agendas. Even programming languages do this, the constant rewriting of various builds and releases consists of constant revisions and rewrites. Wait, what is this I don't even... My point in all of this, is to highlight the fact that the current electronic standards of attribution, copyright and even definitive identity structuring has become essentially flexible to the point of near non-relevance. Creative Commons copyleft models attempt to deal with this, but there is a groaning schism evident between the institutions that demand adherence to this ownership model. This, in turn, brings up many questions concerning legitimacy, what is legitimate in terms of reliable or trusted and valid information, or sources, or authorship, or standards? How do you quantify quality when all benchmarks of established legitimacy are being actively stripped down to a point that originals and copies, or remixes, are all presented as authentic in their own right? Where do the bestseller lists go then? How do we discern how someone is an expert, or indeed a worthwhile or valid creator, if everyone is? So you're saying I'll never make any decent bling when I am a big shot digital or new aesthetic artist? Huh? No, I didn't say that. What I'm trying to get it is a broader picture. I'm trying to illustrate the actual environment you and all your peers, and other up-and-comers, will be working in. That is, the overall scale of the changing marketplace and creative industries, and all the institutionalized brick walls you'll go up against in order to actually create something worthwhile. But it's incredibly important not to let those barriers stop you from getting out there and experimenting through play and embracing novelty. So what are you waiting for? Get out there and do it. Now, 